Hello everybody and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 193. This episode coming to you from the past. Ooh, that's because I'm recording it in advance because in theory at the time you're listening to this, assuming you are listening to this on the day of release, I'm hopefully wandering the decks of USS Constitution. So... With all that in mind, the questions for this week are taken from Guide 241 on the World War I U-boat, U-156. That's the Deutschland-class trade U-boat. And the Wednesday video on the US Navy's mothball fleet. So, let's get on with the questions, shall we? Billy Anizari asks... How did the ABDA task force, which if I remember correctly had roughly equal force against the Japanese cruisers coming at them end up being so decisively defeated in the first battle of the Java Sea? Well, it's one of those cases where on paper stats kind of hide a lot of the fundamental factors. So when you look at the cruisers, you might think, OK, the Allies have two heavy cruisers and three light cruisers. The Japanese have two heavy cruisers and two light cruisers. So surely that's a slight Allied advantage. Uh, the Japanese have 14 destroyers. The Allies only have nine so the Japanese have a destroyer advantage there, but maybe one of the light cruisers makes up for that. But that's a very sort of shallow paper analysis. When you add up the displacement, it turns out displacement of the cruisers total is actually much closer than you might think than a 5 to 4 advantage. There's thirty-seven, just over 37,000 tons of Allied cruisers, just under 35,000, uh, 34,000 tons of Japanese cruisers. So actually the displacement difference between the two is not even enough to fit a light cruiser in there and that's because whilst everybody is bringing rather small light cruisers to the party the uh, Perth and the two Dutch cruisers are not full weight treaty cruisers the same as the two Japanese light cruisers are quite small pre-treaty designs but whilst the Houston the American heavy cruiser that's present is is a treaty design that's almost at full weight. Exeter very definitely is not a full treaty weight design. She's a, a diminutive. And the two Japanese Miyoko class that are present are substantially heavier than the treaty design. And this kind of shows when you compare the total number of guns carried, the Allied ships are carrying 25 roughly 6-inch caliber guns, whereas the Japanese only have 14 but weighed against that is the fact that on the two Dutch ships that are carrying most of those guns, they are laid out in an older style with wing mounts on the Java. So you can't bring all of them to bear, which obviously cuts down the effective broadside. Admit it, and the Japanese obviously have these, these two um, smaller ships with roughly the same kind of armament as the Dutch flagship. But then when you look at the 8-inch guns, the between Exeter and Houston, they have 15 of them. The Japanese have 20 of them. So they have a 25% advantage in the largest amount of on the biggest naval guns. And that's before you get into torpedoes, obviously. the Most of the Allied cruisers, with the exception of Houston, do have torpedoes. Um, not all of them. But the Japanese have more torpedoes aboard their two heavy cruisers and well and their light cruisers as well and they are better torpedoes because they include not in it's their entire fleet doesn't all have long lances but it includes the long lance and then when you look at destroyers only one allied destroyer that's in the initial fleet strength hms jupiter comes close to the japanese destroyers the average displacement of the rest of the allied destroyers apart from jupiter is 13 to 1400 tons the minimum displacement of the Japanese ships is over 1,600 tons, and quite a number of them are well over 2,000 tons. Some of the biggest Japanese destroyers actually are more than double the displacement of the smallest allied ones. And of course, they also have a mix of torpedoes, which include the long lances, which are therefore better than the allied torpedoes. Plus, they're operating as a single language group. They have a single command hierarchy, whereas one of the major problems that dogged ABDA command was the fact that you had two different languages at least being spoken, Dutch and English, 
and four different command structures. Now, to be fair, the Australian Navy and the Royal Navy had practiced working together quite extensively, so you might be able to argue that's more like three, but you still had a US contingent, a Dutch contingent, and a British and Australian contingent, and that split out was at both cruiser and destroyer level, and that did cause issues. And then you get into you know, the fact that because most of the Japanese ships are bigger and more modern, their guns outrange most of the Allied guns. The torpedoes obviously outrange the Allied torpedoes, which means that they can shoot at the Allies when the Allies can't really shoot back all that well. And then you get individual soft factors, like the fact that Exeter's crew were basically new and their gunnery wasn't particularly good. So once you start adding together all of these smaller factors, you realise that actually, whilst on paper the disparity of numbers might not seem too bad, at least at a surface analysis, once you dig deeper, the Japanese force was actually considerably more powerful than the Allied force, even before aircraft get involved. So it's not exactly surprising that it went the way that it did. Neil Newall asks, if U-156 hit a mine, I would think L-8 would have heard an explosion on her hydrophones. This is assuming, of course, that both subs were still in the same range that they saw each other visually at, about three miles. Was there anything in L-8's logs regarding this? No, there wasn't, because you've got to remember that L-8 intercepted U-156 just north of the mine barrier, because obviously L-8 isn't going to venture into its own minefield or a friendly minefield, because mines aren't friendly. The definition of a friendly minefield is one that you laid and that you know where it is. Um, that's really the extent of it. So when it comes to U-156, obviously they sighted it on the surface. Um, they were obviously not able to sink it, but then uh, once U-156 continued onwards into the minefield, L-8 wasn't going to follow it. The minefield's fairly extensive. U-boats don't tend to travel that quickly, especially when submerged. Um, so given the, the, the sort of the time lapse between the last check-in of U-156 and the, when it was supposed to check in next, and obviously failed to do so, the courses of the two subs would have diverged quite a lot. And given that you're talking about World War One hydrophones, it's fairly likely that U-156 would have been well, well past the uh, listening range of L-8's uh, hydrophones by the time it hit anything and obviously then sank and this is of course assuming that that is what happened um, it seems fairly logical because U-156 entered uh, a known mine barrier and didn't report home which you know that <laughs> seems to be a story that writes itself but it could also be any number of other things it could be um, U-156 hit uh, an uncharted underwater seamount. It could be a simple mechanical failure of some kind. We do know, obviously, that in both world wars, a few subs were sunk by, you know, someone just dialing, even something as simple as dialing the toilet flushing system wrong. So, although loss by mine is the most likely theory, it's not the only one. Um, but even if, in the most likely event that it was a mine, there's no particular reason for L8 to have heard it because, to be honest, if L8 was close enough to hear U-156 hitting a mine, assuming that the U-156 didn't hit the very first mine in the field, then chances were that L8 was probably also in the minefield at that point. And, uh, well, understandably, Royal Navy Supreme Captains had a strict aversion to sailing into their own minefields where at all possible, or anywhere near them. David and Martin Alban ask... If HMS Incomparable had actually been built and had been in time for the Battle of Jutland, would she have affected the battle in any way and would she have accomplished anything aside from her lack of armour possibly causing her to explode? Well, yeah, she would have been an interesting ship to have at Jutland. I mean, apart from anything, she's incomparably, hurdy hurdy her, faster than any other ship on the field, which is going to make her interesting choices about where you put her. Um, BT, being a battle cruiser, she's almost certainly going to be assigned to the battle cruiser's fleet, which means BT's almost certainly going to take her as a flagship, um, which could be interesting. But in the thing is, although incomparable for the time period that she's conceived in and for the guns that she's mounting, 
is not the best armoured of vessels. I mean, bearing in mind she's suggested in 1915, which means that by the time her design and um, build theoretically would have been done in the real world, she'd be a 1918, 1919 ship at the very earliest, probably even a 1919, 1920 ship, at which point, you know, there's people running around with 16-inch guns everywhere, and her 11-inch belt armour really isn't adequate for that purpose. However, time warping her back into the Battle of Jutland, an 11-inch belt is actually a very respectable bit of protection if you're going up against first scouting group, because they've only got 11 and 12-inch guns. So, incomparable armour would pretty much, at least at the battle ranges they're fighting at, render her immune, at least over her citadel, to the incoming German fire. So she'd actually be, apart from the Queen Elizabeth's, obviously, the most durable ship in Beatty's formation, and given that he'd probably be leaving the Queen Elizabeth behind, as per historically, he'd be, she'd be the only durable ship in Beatty's formation. I mean, Tiger took a fair bit of a beating as well, but the nine-inch armour you find on the Splendid Cats is right on the borderline for defence against the kind of guns that First Scouting Group are throwing at you. So she's in this weird position of being very fast. She's obviously a very large target. It's not going to take a rocket scientist to hit her, so she probably is going to take quite a battering. Relatively durable, and now the guns are the interesting part, because 620-inch guns, again, assuming they can somehow be built and made somewhat workable, uh, it doesn't really matter how well the German battle cruisers are protected, and to be perfectly honest, it doesn't even really matter that much how badly functioning the British fuses are in the way that they were malfunctioning at Jutland, um, or should I say, not working as they intended them to. Um, but yeah, if if you're firing 20-inch guns, even a Der Flinger, the shell's just going to power straight through a Der Flinger or any other German battlecruiser's armour just by sh almost sheer force of will at the ranges that they're fighting. So incomparable will be able to inflict absolutely devastating damage on anything that it actually hits with the one caveat obviously being it's only got six guns and it's going to have a relatively slow rate of fire so it's kind of going to be a case of just hope you don't get hit but if you do get hit you you're really really going to know about it i mean look at the damage that the queen elizabeth with 15 inch guns did um, and now I imagine the square cube law working up with the 20 inch or 508 millimeter shells. Although, to be honest, the biggest risk is that if somehow somebody has built a fully functioning incomparable and kicked it back through time to Jutland, that's now going to be the new baseline for anything that's built subsequently, which means that the, well, the immediate post warship designs, they're going to be even crazier than the ones that the Washington Treaty curbed. Naval Baguette asks, is there a chance of a video dedicated to the Franklin expedition, or maybe a review of the TV series The Terror? Definitely. I mean, at least for the first part. The Franklin expedition is obviously using Royal Navy vessels. It's using a bunch of people from the Royal Navy. It is a civilian exploration mission, to be fair, yes, but it's also far far close enough to naval history to warrant a video on the channel at some point much the same way as technically drake's expedition around the world isn't a royal navy expedition but let's face it it's getting reviewed on this channel at some point because well it's drake's round the world expedition might do mcgellan's as well at some point um you know it, it's all very closely related and it's all maritime history so sure let's let's have a crack at that the only thing i would say is that once again, given the experiences I've had with my uh, attempt to review uh, one U-boat movie so far, um, I'm not going to be touching The Terror or any other movie for quite some time to come, um, as I said, until I can work out the issues with that video, um, because I don't want copyright strikes from idiotic companies who don't understand the concept of review and fair use. <sighs> Isn't it a wonderful world that we live in? Brendan Buersdorf asks about the different systems for submarine mine laying, and also could I do a video about them? Yeah, a video about mine laying systems in general seems like a good idea at some point, but to briefly cover off the 
four main types of mine laying system that existed in World War One and World War Two. You have uh, the German dedicated submarine mine laying system, as you can see here. Um, so this consists of a number of tubes which are installed almost vertical launch style in the hull of a submarine. However, they don't launch upwards the way that modern vertical launch systems do. As you can see in the diagram, they actually drop the mines out the bottom. Uh, the mines then anchor, um, unfurl, and hopefully the sub isn't there at the time when they start popping back up. So that's one way of having a dedicated mine launch system. Another way, which you could see on a number of mine laying subs, including the Rockwall class of the Royal Navy, involved having the mines placed outside the pressure hull. Uh, they would have usually two long racks of mines running above the pressure hull but under the outer hull casing along the top of the sub with the ejection ports out of the back. And so you could obviously motor along just popping mines out the back quite happily like that. Both of these types of mine laying subs obviously had to be quite large and the fact they had these large dedicated storage compartments for the mines also meant that they were relatively good at transporting cargo when the need arose if you replace the mines with cargo. Oddly enough a lot of mine laying vessels tend to end up transporting things other than mines, kind of like the Abdeel class mine layers at various points. Then you have submarines that are kind of pressed into service so at its most crude you can just stick a bunch of mine racks onto the exterior of a submarine you have to rig some kind of release mechanism that hopefully can be triggered from inside the sub unless you want to play the role of a very weird surface mine layer but you can do it and equally you can also have containerized mines if there's enough space between the inner pressure hull and the outer hull casing although in those cases again you have to work out a way of releasing them so you can jury rig any sub to be a mine layer in world one or world war two in that manner but it is a bit ad hoc and a bit dangerous and then finally what you see in World War II, especially from the US, although they do share the technology with others, is they also develop a kind of mine that can be fired through a torpedo tube because these mines, the, the more conventional ones you can see on the screen, are standard sea mines. They're quite large. They're not going to fit a 21-inch torpedo tube. But because of the lack of dedicated mine-laying submarines in large numbers, combined with the fact that, you know... <laughs> Um, especially at the start of the US's involvement in World War One, when they realized actually the, the torpedo element isn't working out too well, they managed to develop a smaller mine that could be carried instead of torpedoes and then obviously doesn't have a propulsion mechanism so you can carry more of them compared to the number of torpedoes that you could carry and then you can just pop those out of the torpedo tubes that's relatively quick and easy conversion doesn't require any external racks etc the only thing it does do obviously is it reduces or possibly even eliminates your torpedo carriage and compared to the dedicated mine laying subs which as we said are considerably larger in the first place the relatively limited space even for small mines in a torpedo room means that you can't carry quite as many mines as a dedicated mine laying sub the flip side is the convenience of being able to switch out any of your fleet subs into mine laying rolls at the drop of a hat. The RWS96 asks, how is it that the US Navy can preserve their ships so well and at such relatively low cost when museum ships have such a hard time doing it? There's two major factors. The first one is what is relatively low cost for the US Navy is not the same as what is relatively low cost to the rest of us mere mortals, including the people who run museum ships. Um, low cost is in comparison to the costs of actually running the ships, which obviously involves fuel and all sorts of other consumables, wear and tear, the crew, crew salary expenditure is a huge portion of any naval budget. Um, so, you know, simply by just having a couple of people pottering around keeping the preservation systems going, that massively slashes the running costs of a, a ship in a navy um, as compared to anything else. And I say that's before you get into the wear and tear, the dry docking, uh, expenditure of ammunition, food, uh, 
um, oil, grease, etc., etc., etc. So, um, as compared to a museum ship, which has to operate with actually, you know, getting money from visitors and grants and such, like, I mean, to give you some idea of the example, uh, an example, uh, take a modern, well, they're a little bit long in the tooth now, but a relatively modern 688i attack submarine, i.e. Um, one of the more recent Los Angeles class. That thing has 12 vertical launch tubes for Tomahawk cruise missiles. Now, if a submarine, a US submarine, was to volley fire its load of 12 cruise missiles at a target, that would be considered a fairly low-cost attack by US Navy standards. Uh, it's 12 missiles, you know, launch, go away, whatever, nobody's really going to blink too much of an eye about it. And indeed, to be honest, a 12 missile attack might actually be considered relatively small. But given that each of those Tomahawks costs almost $2 million a piece, um, that single volley of missiles, not including the running and operational cost to get that submarine to its launch point and back again, just the cost of the missiles you volley fired, um, a dozen missiles, the monetary value of those would instead pay for like, I think something close to 70% of the total cost of complete renovation, restoration, and relocation of the battleship USS Texas, and that project is quite expensive. You know, go to any other museum ship and say, hey, we've got near enough, 20, just over $20 million of funding for you. Pretty much most curators would rip your arm off for, the, for that opportunity. Um, and yet for the US Navy, spending $20 million firing a bunch of tomahawks from a single sub is not exactly something to even really enter in as a as a rounding error on their budget so scale of what is low cost is one thing the other thing which is much more prosaic and much more day-to-day -day, is that one of the best ways of keeping a ship in reserve somewhat intact is as covered in the video on the mothball fleet to dry out the inside as much as humanly possible whilst coating the things that you don't want to dry out completely in preservative if you coat everything that you don't want to dry out on a museum ship in preservative then there's not going to be a lot interesting to see and annoying people will probably start you know trying to swipe the preservative paste and eat it or something uh, which usually won't end well coupled with humans have this annoying thing called breathing <laughs> It's a really bad habit. We should probably kick it at some point. But whilst we do, we exhale a lot of moisture. And moisture is the killer of ships um, because it's the vector for rust, rot, mold, everything else. So on a ship that's in the mothball fleet, they can run the desiccation machines and the, the air conditioning and everything and turn the humidity inside the ships down and keep it that way because there's nobody in there and if you do have to send somebody in there well they can wear a mask uh, or something as in a full proper you know, gas mask or something or air supply whereas on a museum ship if they want to get funding from ticket sales they have to have people on board and all those people on board who come and look at the ship they touch the ship they spread germs and all sorts of funny things around but they more to the point exhale an awful lot of moisture which then helps all of that spread and so a, you're going to be fighting that kind of thing, um, you know, rust and everything on museum ships a lot more. And B, you have a catch-22 of you need to run your air conditioners and dehumidifiers at much higher settings because you've got a lot more moisture to get out on any given day. But you also can't run them for too long or too high settings because otherwise you turn the interior arid and then everybody starts choking and gagging because their throat's very dry, etc. So museum ships have a lot more challenges when it comes to maintaining their ships than mothballing an active warship does. Brian Barriga asks, are there any famous ships still in the US mothball fleet, i.e. World War II or Korean War veterans, in the reserve fleet as of this year? Sadly not. The vast majority of World War II and Korean War veteran ships were actually scrapped during the Cold War in the 70s, 80s, uh, etc. 
and what few were left, things like the Iowas obviously went out of service in the 90s and early 2000s, um, became museum ships, so they're not in the reserve fleet anymore. If you look at the active listings of current U.S. reserve fleet vessels, the vast, vast majority of them are actually transport ships, <laughs> relatively mundane. Um, but given that logistics and infrastructure is the backbone of any successful naval campaign, probably not a bad idea to have several dozen of them in mothballs. Um, the only kind of active, well, semi-active combat vessels, I suppose you could say, that are still in the U.S. Reserve Fleet are, well, apparently the couple of the Ticonderogas recently gone in there. Um, some Oliver Hazard Perrys, um, when, you know, when Michael Bay isn't blowing them up for movie purposes. There's, as you can see here, a couple of Tarawa-class assault ships and at least one carrier, uh, conventional-powered supercarrier. Obviously, Kitty Hawk recently went for breaking up. So, yeah, I mean, a number of those ships will be known because there'll be a fair number of surviving crew around, and a number of those ships will have served in more recent conflicts. But in terms of World War II Korean War stuff, um, as far as I'm aware, no, there isn't anything like that, certainly in terms of combat vessels still in the U.S. Reserve Fleet. M167A1 asks, What was the criteria after World War II for ships to be kept in the active navy? It seems that some older ships were kept on and some newer ones were mothballed. So the calculus was quite ruthless and it was mostly to do with cost. Um, the Royal Navy had this a lot, a lot harsher, which was one of the reasons that Vanguard was eventually disposed of. But effectively... At the end of World War II, when the U.S. Navy was downsizing, you were looking at trying to maintain as much of a Navy as possible on a relatively limited budget. So they ended up effectively dividing the, the fleet up thus. So you had ships that were either too worn out, too combat damaged, or just too hopelessly obsolete to be viable combatants in the future. So those would go pretty much immediately to the scrapyard. So those would be things like the Omaha class, any surviving Wicks and Clemson class, etc. Then you had ships that were old or older, not necessarily brilliant as frontline combatants even then. I mean, they do okay, but probably in the future would be second-line combatants. Still worth having around, but, you know, probably have a relatively limited shelf life left to them. And as I said, not exactly uh, much of a deterrent in peacetime. So those would go into the reserve. So some things like the New surviving New Orleans class heavy cruisers or the surviving Atlanta class and its, its derivatives. Um, basically, almost anything that had been built pre-war. Then you had what was left, which was war build and new build stuff. Now, when it came to this stuff, theoretically, it was all fairly modern, fairly frontline. Um, some ships might have combat damage or heavy wear and tear if they, you know, hit the water in for the U.S. Navy. Let's say if they'd hit the water in mid-1941, they'd been employed pretty much throughout the war. Um, but largely, this group it came down to to cost. So if it was expensive to run and there was a cheaper alternative, then it would almost certainly go off to reserve, the exceptions being occasionally if stuff was very, very new. So, for example, the Alaska class were very new, almost, almost fresh out of the dockyard, but were incredibly expensive to run compared to heavy cruisers or indeed battleships. Um, for what they offered so they went into the reserves pretty quickly whereas the Des Moines offered an awful lot of firepower and weren't too manpower intensive when you compared them to something like a Baltimore class um, you know the the additional manpower versus additional firepower balance was relatively good so the the Des Moines stayed around um, whereas the Worcesters were compared to something like a Cleveland, very manpower intensive, not necessarily the most reliable of things. They cost a lot to run, 
And so it, you could actually run, say, a pair of Clevelands instead of a single Worcester. So the Worcesters, despite being quite new, ended up in the reserve fleet fairly quickly, whereas a bunch of Clevelands stuck around for quite a while. And then, of course, you have stuff that's just surplus to requirements. So the South Dakotas, again, relatively new battleships, but the US didn't feel the need to run all that many battleships immediate post-war, so they went into the reserves. Some of the Essexes as well, um, because they didn't think they are going to need to run so many carriers, uh, and so on and so forth. And when the, the other minor, minor criteria when it came to, come to some of the very new ships was also the potential for future upgrades. So, for example, Franklin and Bunker Hill, having been rebuilt practically um, after their various incidents in the Second World War, in 1945-46, were probably some of the, the freshest carriers the US Navy had, but because of that, they kept them in reserve because they thought, well, we've got these now in slightly worse condition, Essex class, we can play around with those, experiment, upgrade, etc. And then once we've figured out what the ultimate version of the Essex is going to be like, we can apply that to this practically now brand new shiny one in reserve and get a really good unit that will last for a very long time. As it turned out, um, events and further carrier design supersede that and those two ships never saw active service again, but that was the idea at the time. Alpha Tango asks, why were some mothball fleets in the water and others pulled up onto land? Uh, because I can see a few major issues with leaving a fully wooden vessel out of water for a few generations or so. Mostly it comes down to size, because ships generally are not long-term self-supporting structures out of the water. Um, this is been a factor more recently on HMS Victory when they did a scan and they discovered that the frame she'd been sitting in for the better part of a hundred years had supported the bits that they were directly supporting well enough but the bits that they weren't supporting were sagging around the frame so she was flowing around the, the frame she was supporting and they had to change it to more numerous smaller supports and this is why for amongst other things, why when a ship is launched, especially a warship, you usually see it launched without most of its superstructure, without any of its heavy guns, usually even without its armour belt, etc. Uh, apart from the stability issues, because obviously it's out of the water, um, the other fact is that the hull long term will buckle if it's just sat out of water with no particular support um, or the wrong kind of support under its own weight. Uh, this is why dry docks have to be very careful about how you position the supports for a ship's hull, and also why ships try not to spend years in dry dock. Um, a, a few weeks or a few months is fine, but long term it's very bad, and obviously multiple fleets tend to be for years, if not decades at a time. Um, so large ships you do not want to be storing out of the water, um, also, large ships tend to be very difficult to haul out of the water. They tend to weigh several thousand tons or more, and just getting them out of the water in the first place would be quite the feat. Uh, back in ancient times, when things like triremes were all, almost but not quite disposable elements, then sure, you could haul them up out of the water. They were light enough to do so, and... You know, dry reams needed a little bit of time soaking in the water anyway, so a bit of warping here and there it wouldn't make too much odds. It'd settle itself back into the water once you had to launch them again. And to be honest, they'd probably have rotted away before major warping set in anyway, whether they were on land or in the water. But smaller craft, i.e. ones that could be reliably self-supporting in the water, those you definitely could store on land and would benefit from it and that's the reason why this particular photo has been sitting in the background during this question because these are the gunboat sheds at Haslar uh, so in the Crimean War the Royal Navy commissioned a massive fleet of gunboats most of which weren't completed in time for the end of the war and then afterwards they've had a massive fleet of gunboats and they realized well if we leave them in the water they'll soak up water and rot away and take up annoying amounts of space that's not very useful and so they stuck them in these sheds where they were kept relatively dry out of the water and preserved and stuck around for a very long time just in case they would end up needing them. And of course, 
Well, gunboat diplomacy in the latter Victorian era gives you a clue as to what some of them were actually used for. Crazy Warriors Cat Fan asks, at 4235 in the video on the multiple fleet, you can see sheds on an Iowa class battleship. What are those sheds for? So here's the picture in question, and yes, you can see there are a number of sheds on the back of this particular Iowa class battleship. Now, there's a few reasons for these to be here on a mothballed ship. You can see some of the more dome type arrangements covering some of the uh, gun, anti aircraft gun emplacements with the 40 mils. Some of those sheds are there for pretty much similar reasons, except that the objects that they're covering aren't of a shape that can be easily domed or efficiently domed and so a shed of some shape or size you can see there's a whole variety of different ones there's three largish ones of different dimensions on the back there's a couple of slightly smaller dimensions either side of the aft main gun turret etc so some of these will just be the most efficient way of covering up something that you want kept out of the elements um, in terms of the ship structure or components of the ship. Others will be concealing and sheltering some of the dehumidification equipment and access points to the ship to ensure, obviously, that a, a good seal is maintained. And on larger ships in reserves, one or two of them might also even hold things like um, equipment, so tools, respirators, changing areas, etc., for men who have to then go in and actually, you know, help maintain the ship whilst it's in mothballs. So there's a whole variety of potential uses uh, for them, but the vast majority of them are simply just to keep uh, an air and water seal over something that you don't want to decay and can't be quite efficiently covered by one of the wonderful little dome tents they've got there. Richard Goss asks, Hi Drac, I was thinking, regarding all the design work that went into the G3s, would the Royal Navy heavy or light cruisers have been more capable warships with a similar gun layout and shorter citadel to protect? In my mind, they should have been better protected than other contemporary cruisers apart from the rear firing arcs. Can you see any possible issues? The two main issues I can see are that if you want to have an 8 or 9 gun forward armament, that means that either you're going to have to go Tone style four twins forward, which, considering Tone is above the treaty limits, is probably going to be quite difficult to pull off, bearing in mind that the only British heavy cruisers that were actually built used twin turrets, or the British are going to need to embrace the triple turret. And if they do embrace the triple turret, then they might come up with something like this, um, which, again, I knocked up in Ultimate Admiral Dreadnought. So this is a three triple eight all forward layout heavy cruiser um, with twin four inch AA midships and aft and uh, just stuck some quad torpedo launchers forward because I felt like it and I've even preserved as you can see there a little space for um, catapult aircraft so if the British had adopted the triple turret um, for heavy cruiser designs then yeah they might have been able to pull something like this off the main problem with having this kind of layout for a cruiser as opposed to a capital ship is that cruisers tend to face slightly more dynamic engagement profiles. So not having a rear firing arc with your heavy guns could be considerably more of a problem for a heavy cruiser or a light cruiser than it would be for a battleship. So that may explain the hesitancy in the Royal Navy to adopt this kind of layout, even though, as you say, it would mean that you could get a better protected cruiser and well, with nine guns, actually a slightly more powerful broadside than the county class as well. I think when it comes to when they were designing the county class, bearing in mind that they did also make the, those guns with hilarious elevation, is one of those slightly amusing things wherein the British managed to make an 8-inch turret, twin turret, with significantly greater elevation than the 4.7-inch notional anti-aircraft guns that they were using, but never mind. And, well, making a 70 degree plus elevation triple eight inch turret might also put them off but if they drop that idea then it's an entirely plausible design um, one way or the other of course some of that issue could be solved by placing the torpedo launchers towards the aft end because that gives you a literal sting in your tail if someone is behind you and as you know i am a fan of the all forward design so i would not object in the slightest to seeing this kind of thing come to fruition <laughs> 
M Flash asks, would fitting the Dido class cruisers with 4.5 inch twin BD mountings as fitted to the carriers Renown, Queen Elizabeth, Valiant, etc., have been physically possible? And would 12 4.5 inch have produced a more effective anti aircraft cruiser? Yes, fitting the 4.5 inch mount would be entirely possible. It's significantly lighter than the twin 5.25, so yeah, they're. You could, I mean, obviously you're, you have to change all the shell voices, etc. But if you're designing it from the start or retrofitting it, because as you can see here with HMS Scylla, they did actually put 4.5 twin mountings on anyway, albeit these aren't the pancake ones from the capital ships and the carriers. You know, it's an entirely doable thing. Um, it would have saved... Hmm, well, yeah, no, actually, actually would have saved enough weight to have another turret. So, yes, you could have triple stack pancake 4.5s forward and triple stack pancake 4.5s aft to make a Dido AA cruiser. Uh, well, even more of an AA cruiser than it was originally designed to be. Would it have produced more effective anti-aircraft cruiser? Yes. The 4.5 had fewer issues than the 5.25, and you're adding a couple of extra barrels. So, as an anti-aircraft cruiser, it would have been great. The only hesitancy I would have with it is that the Dido's ended up being fleet cruisers quite a lot of the time. And it's something I keep pointing out in that whilst they, the Dido's weren't quite as effective an AA cruiser, in, at least in their 5.25 inch form, as something like an Atlanta, they did do significantly better fighting on the battle line than the Atlantas did because the long barrel 5.25 had the shell weight and the muzzle velocity to throw shells if not necessarily quite as far as say a town class or a leander at least most of the way so they could engage with those other cruisers um obviously fighting against the italians so my only hesitancy would be that if you have a effectively british version of an atlanta armed with numerous 4.5 inch guns it might not do quite as well in cruiser battle lines so that that would be the only reservation really brian smith asks in honor of drax trip to the united states if you took all the museum ships in the states and they're restored to their world war ii condition how would that fleet rank compared to other fleets during world war ii if you include ships like midway and u505 it would be a very bizarre fleet um considering you'd have about one overset strength squadron of submarines, a, well, if you're going by flotilla strength, a slightly understrength flotilla, or two half squadrons, so yeah, maybe one destroyer squadron's worth of destroyers, um, two cruisers, <laughs> one Cleveland and one Des Moines, um, and then seven battleships and five fleet carriers. <laughs> So hilarious. Well, you, you might just about get a usable fleet screen out of your your small mix of destroyers and your two cruisers, but you know your battleships are going to be doing as much fleet screening as your your small ships are, um, and, and maybe throwing a couple of extra. There's a couple of destroyer escorts floating around as well that might help. But yeah, it would be a very very bizarre fleet. Um, obviously the stuff that's newer because you said restored to World War One, uh, two conditions, so anything that's newer, because there are a few nuclear subs and stuff, um, I'm discounting those because they would have just been raw materials in the ground in World War Two. Um, but anyway, you would have had, um, a fleet that would be in desperate, desperate, desperate need of escorts. Um, it'd be building cruisers and destroyers left and right or buying them left and right, but if we temporarily ignore that slight problem and just go with the capital ship fleet, uh, i.e. the carriers and the battleships, you would have a fleet that numerically, for capital ships, would be the fourth most powerful fleet in the world, after the actual historical US Navy, the Royal Navy, and the Japanese Navy. And in terms of practical um, combat strength, probably the second oh no no not the second the third most powerful navy in the world um just going purely by capital ships because you've got four iowas two south dakotas and a north carolina so you've got seven modern fast battleships whereas the japanese you know they've got 
Congos, Fusos, Nagato. Uh, sort of, yeah, okay, maybe the Nagato is roughly approaching parity. But really, at that point, if, you, if you're if you going pre-Mutsu's explosion, the Japanese have four modern fast capital ships that can go toe-to-toe -to -toe with your seven. Um, everything else is either far too slow um, or hideously vulnerable. And then in carrier terms, well, four Essexes in a midway, that's probably... Well, that is a much stronger force than the six carrier Kira Butai. Um, and the only and the only reason that the Royal Navy would be stronger overall is because, well, by the end of the war, the Royal Navy has a decent number of fast battleships and a bunch of older ones, and they have a lot of carriers. You know, they don't have anything in World War II that can match an Essex or a Midway 1v1, but there's an awful lot more of them, <laughs> which is something the Japanese can't say. Of course, the most likely outcome in, in this particular scenario, if you don't expand your cruise and destroy forces very quickly, is everything gets sunk by submarines. But um, that's uh, neither here nor there. Dr. D. M. Platt asks, How are depth charge throwers such as K and Y guns reloaded at sea? Relatively simply, actually. Here's a Y gun in use, but uh, the K gun is just basically half of a Y gun. As you can see, the depth charge isn't exactly at record-breaking height, but there are some images available which also show them being reloaded. So what you'd have, uh, as you can see in the back, just at the back of the uh, Y gun from this perspective, you can see that kind of pillar standing up and then curving over. So something, either that or something like that in the vicinity would have a pulley on it and a block and tackle unit. And you would just uh, put a pair of grabbing claws on a hook. The grabbing claws would grab either end of a depth charge. And then usually three people on the rope and one person guiding it would lift the depth charge, which obviously weighs a fair bit, and lower it into position ready to go. And in absolute worst case scenarios, if you really, really were stuck, those four men could in theory lift the depth charge into position manually. But considering that most depth charges were in the region of 350 to 450 pounds, or around about 200 kilos, give or take, um, you really, really didn't want to have to lift that if by hand if you could avoid it. So that's why the block and tackle pulley system was much, much, much more preferred. And even then, as I said, it still took uh, a number of men to haul the thing up. There were some lighter depth charges available as well, but even a 150 kilo depth charge is still not something you'd particularly want to try lifting by the rim in the middle of heaving seas. Next, when Dreadnought came out, every pre-Dreadnought became at, base, at best second line units, but quite a few ships were brand new with some still under construction. Did any nation try or at least design a change or upgrade to an older ship to something like Dreadnought? by at least, say, removing the secondary weapons and trying to fit main gun turrets. So I feel like I've answered this question relatively recently or something very similar to it, um, but repeating that, the short answer is no, not really, um, because the amount of work that would have needed to have been done was far, far too expensive, far too complex, and would have taken far too long, and would still have produced an inferior ship at a rate, at a time when the ship, the very ships that you would want to refit, things like the Lord Nelsons, um, were, oh, and, and not, and bearing in mind that not all late model pre dreadnoughts even had secondary turrets to replace the German Deutschland class, for example. Um, but even for the ones that did, um, these were your most powerful other assets, other than your very, very few dreadnoughts. So taking them out of commission so soon after they'd complete, been completed would significantly weaken your fleet, and by the time they were truly obsolete, as in there were enough dreadnoughts around, then you'd already moved on to second-gen dreadnoughts and first-gen super dreadnoughts, at which point they would be inferior even with a couple of 12-inch guns on the side. The only people who seem to even have looked at it at all are the French because they were still in the process of drawing up the Danton class when the first news of Dreadnought began to leak out and there seems to have been some very very brief consideration as to whether or not all the 
the twin secondary guns could have been replaced with single 12 inch guns which would give you a seven gun broadside but they very quickly decided it would not work for them and they didn't do it it never made it to a full design scheme consideration it was just a brief kind of well what if Admiral Tiberius asks, how often did the Essex class work up to their top speed, and were the top speeds of the North Carolina and South Dakota class a hindrance? So, when aircraft carriers are doing their fly tops, it's usually a good idea to work up to maximum speed, because you, know, you obviously you want a headwind as well, but even if you have a headwind, you moving at top speed mean maximizes the total airflow which max maximizes the total lift for the aircraft taking off which means they can take off with heavier loads and or more safely so typically when an Essex class was conducting fly tops it would be running up to top speed or something close to it now in the context of whether or not the obviously 28 knot ish in the North Carolina cases and 28 knot in the South Dakota cases top speeds were limitations it was a little bit of a hindrance but um it wasn't too much of a problem you still had destroyers and cruisers that could keep up and the way forward in that kind of operation had been pointed to by british carry ops in the mediterranean and such like in the early part of the war where they didn't even have 28 knot ships you had to, ships like warspite that could maybe push 25 and they were still having to escort carrier flight ops and so what would be done is because obviously the carrier would know in advance when it's going to launch uh, flight, uh, aircraft in significant numbers. And so with the plan already laid out and the wind direction known, the battleship could, if it was felt necessary to have it in formation, simply turn and head in that direction ahead of time. So if, let's say, the, the battleship was on your starboard beam, the battleship would then go to full speed whilst you were still at cruising speed and turn into the wind and head off in that direction and it could happily motor along open up a bit of a lead and then when it came time for the air ops the carrier would wind up to top speed turn into the wind and it would eventually run down dash overhaul the battleship in question but in the time it took the flight ops to actually be done it wouldn't be too much of a problem because you've got to remember that you know it, certainly by the time the Essex class are in service you really want to be getting your aircraft airborne well on inside an hour and the speed difference 33 knots to 28 knots for the US operations in question five knots uh, five nautical miles an hour um, well as long as your ship your capital ship has at least a two to three mile lead and that's not a tremendously t terrible range to have uh, the ship as a screen anyway then if it's got a two to three mile lead you'll overhaul it part way through and let's say an hour long fly tops run and it'll be maybe a couple of miles behind you by the time you finish but it's all at all times it's still within a decent coverage radius and you know, obviously, if it pulls out ahead a little bit further, then it it may not fall back at all. Uh, you might just catch up with it a little bit. So it it could it is a little bit of an issue because there is a brief window where it's going to be artificially relatively far ahead, and obviously, you know, something like an Iowa could keep pace with the carriers and thus offer much closer protection. But it's not an insurmountable issue. Edward Franklin Woods asks, when and why did the Royal Navy cease the daily rum ration? The rum ration was stopped in 1970, um, basically because it was felt by the higher ups that uh, operating complex electronics and having a reasonable amount of rum per day were not necessarily compatible. Um, I, I guess there's some logic to that somewhere i mean i'd point to you know all the other complex machinery that various royal navy officers and men had been operating for well if you if you're just going by very complex machinery up to about a century up until that point without any major issues so yeah smacks to me more of the, the fact they probably just didn't want to pay for the rum anymore but oh well that's when it was 1970 Bill Brockman asks, given the extremely long time between the shots of the major guns on ironclads during the central battery disappearing mount dash early turret period, 
Would smart tactics encourage firing first or waiting to close the range and hoping you didn't get hit whilst doing so? It was a calculated risk that different navies and indeed sometimes different fleets within certain navies approached in different ways because if you fired first the guns were so powerful and so devastating that if you could guarantee that you would hit your opponent you could either take them out of the fight entirely or badly cripple them right from the start which would obviously put you at a major advantage. The flip side to that is that if you miss or your hits aren't particularly telling or the enemy armor stops the incoming projectiles because you fired at a longer range then it's going to take you a while to reload and during that time your enemy can be closing completely unmolested and then they can get a broadside off which is obviously going to be more powerful because it's at a shorter range and more likely to hit as well which is going to be a major problem uh, for you so you might therefore want to hold your fight until you get into close range and then hit at uh, basically guarantee that you get your hits at close range and then close in to do something else whether that be ramming or boarding or whatever so you can see kind of why ramming came back into vogue because it in some ways it was almost a reversion to early tudor period single broadside and board tactics of the old big spanish galleons except replace board with ram or or something different um or you could sort of sweep in if you felt fast enough and agile enough sweep in deliver a broadside and then turn away run away reload and come back again which again is actually very much Tudor period tactics because that's basically what the English race built galleons did to the armada in the run up the channel so effectively you were just taking a risk if you open fire at long range you or what counted for long range at the time you had a chance to score a killing or telling blow right off the bat the longer and longer you waited, the longer and long, um, longer it was that the enemy had a chance to fire on you, and thus the more likely they might get a devastating broadside in at closer range. So it's very much a game of brinksmanship at that point. And this was one of the reasons why secondary batteries began to pl proliferate, because obviously you had quite extensive quick-firing secondaries in ships before the establishment of the classic pre-dreadnought design and they existed pretty much because once quick firing technology reached things like six inch gun level it was thought right well we might get a broadside off with our big guns and then it's going to be a fight between smaller guns for a long time until we can get the big guns reloaded again and then maybe that'll help us finish the enemy off Bruce Kiernan asks, In your midway discussion with John Parshall, passing mention was made about the accuracy of Japanese destroyer captain by Tamichi Hara in the same context that Mutsuo Fushida's account of midway has to be discounted. I've read Hara's account several times and enjoyed it. I can find nothing on the internet disparaging it. Could you elaborate on the quality of the accounts in the book? So when it comes to this particular account, Captain Hara's accounts of the actions themselves are pretty decent um they're obviously subject to a certain degree of observer bias much as anything is i mean by the time you're listening to this the um the video on the scrap iron flotilla has come out and you know whilst when i was reading the book wonderfully entitled scrap iron flotilla which was written by one of the officers who served aboard it it was published shortly after the war and it reflects some incidences which were instances uh, or encounters where the crews and the wartime records up till that point after the war were pretty darn sure that something had happened whether they uh, you know shot down an aircraft or sunk a submarine or um, blown up a destroyer or something but subsequent research shows didn't happen um, maybe the submarine was damaged or the destroyer was damaged um, but it wasn't destroyed or certainly there's no record of a submarine being lost on that date by either the Kriegsmarine or the Regia Marina. Um, and obviously you have to filter through that to make sure you tell an accurate account of what they did. And similarly to an extent, you know, what he saw um, at these various battles is going to be coloured by obviously his perceptions and also the limited field of view that he has. Um, he can obviously add things in because he's writing post-war from uh, official histories and such but as we know even the official histories that were published shortly post-world war ii weren't entirely reliable but 
that's details but it, it, his accounts of the actions do give a fairly good idea of what he and his crew were perceiving so you know it's it's not as it's nowhere near as bad as Fushida where you have you know things that are entirely made up like the packed flight decks thing at Midway um however as with many memoirs of um, Axis military officers it it does when it when it when he talks about his superiors it does smack just a little bit of the same kind of thing you see in a lot of German memoirs uh, military aviation history and military history visualizer both covered this quite extensively for the obviously land and um, air components where you know if you read Gudjeren's memoirs or um, someone like that magically everything is Hitler's fault you know, I wanted to do this, but Hitler said no. Or Hitler said do this, and I said that was a stupid idea, but he said do it anyway. This kind of thing. And I get, And similarly, some of his... I mean, some of his reflections, some of the failings of the Japanese high command are entirely valid, but others, they, they do read a little bit more like, well, now that the war's over, we know this was stupid, uh, therefore I knew this was stupid all along, and, it, well, it's just my idiot superiors didn't go along with it. So you do have to be a little bit careful with it and I, I think that's the thing when you when you're reading any kind of first person account is unless it can be independently verified or unless it's something that specifically happened to that person um post-war opinions on things can be colored a little bit by uh, well survivor bias and also obviously in the case of the axis uh, a need to explain why they lost and in the case of the allies um, perhaps a slightly over overdoing their part occasionally it's not not all the time and as i say um the uh Tamichi hara's book is definitely worth reading there's plenty of valuable stuff in there it's just not 100 percent gospel and that brings us to the end of this week's Dry Dock. Thank you very much for listening. And uh, if you've reached this point and you are still wondering how on earth you can come and meet me during the US trip, well, well, given that this is hopefully the Sunday you're listening to it, I've already been to Salem. I'm hopefully at this point on the Constitution. Um, but again, if you're listening to this on the Sunday of release, then tomorrow I'll be on USS Massachusetts and Battleship Cove and the rest of the list of places to, that I'll be can be found on uh, drakinafel.co.uk under the US tour tab. So dates, times of meetups, places of meetups, etc. all there. So hope to see a few of you there. And uh, if I have seen one or two of you already... Um, thank you for coming to see me, and I hope it all went well. I mean, I'm recording this before I took off, so who? how do I know? Maybe one of you shoved me over the side of Salem. Could be worse. <laughs>